Have you ever heard the discussion that the way that biblical scholars talk about the Bible is different than, let's say, how a preacher will talk to a congregation? Have you ever heard that discussion? Oh yeah, um, Bart Ehrman wrote uh, in his book, Jesus Interrupted, he has a whole introduction section where he talks about how even the preachers uh, who, are t who are preaching the Bible to their congregations, those preachers have really gone to seminaries, they've gone to theology schools, they've learned all of these things like you know half the letters of Paul are forgeries and there's you know hundreds and hundreds of variant readings and manuscripts don't agree and all of this stuff. Uh, and and the, the sequence of the, the fact that the gospels were written decades after the epistles uh, like a lot of Christians don't even know that, right? right? They usually think the gospels came first. And so um, there's a lot of these things that these preachers know. They know these things. They learn them in school uh, when they be, to get their qualification to be preachers, but they don't communicate them to the, the people in the pews because uh, it would be very unpopular for them to do that. And er Ehrman has his own analysis of why he thinks that is and how widespread it is. And I think he's right about that, uh, that there is this sort of, this sort of sense that don't tell the public that, <laughs> right? right. Uh, and so uh, that definitely is going on a lot. Uh, you, you don't get accurate history from the pulpit. Yeah, so uh, I was in university for theological and biblical studies along my deconversion process. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of learning things like that, like what is actually talked about in, uh, in the academic world yeah. versus what you know to be heard or experienced when you go to church. Yeah, they're, right. They're different. They're so different. Um, so we got comments coming in. I want to throw yeah. something right back at you. We already we already touched on it, uh, but let me read this back to you. So Christian historians are therefore non-reliable when it comes to the Christian faith because of the fact that they are Christian. How do you how do you come back at that? Now I'm sure um, you didn't say, or I'll let you speak for yourself. Yeah, I, but I mean it's not it's not every case of that's that's true so you take like uh the scholar raymond brown uh a, a renowned now he's now deceased but a renowned catholic super devout catholic scholar he was really good at distinguishing faith-based beliefs from what he could argue from history and so if you read his his uh and he's not right about everything but he's he does that sort of he really attempts to be objective about what can you argue from historical evidence and he admits almost nothing like very little of this can you actually argue to a high certainty from historical evidence. Most things like the virgin birth, it's just a faith belief. You, you can't base it on historical evidence. And um, so you can have scholars like this, and there's a whole, the whole tradition of liberal scholars as well, um, that can achieve a certain amount of objectivity on a lot of things about Christianity. But fundamentalists can't because they have to have, the Bible can't be, it has to be inerrant uh, and it has to be the true literal word of God. And that, that completely hobbles any honest objective approach to the texts and to the history. Uh, so I think fundamentalists like can only be good scholars and, and reliable on things that they do not depend upon for their salvation. Uh, so, so questions that quote unquote don't matter for their dogmas, maybe they can do good work on, but as soon as it's touching on any issue that they would be kicked out of their, you know, evangelical philosophical society for suggesting as Mike Lacona was, he was uh, kicked out of, uh, he was fired from his job, the Christian, famous Christian apologist, fired for his job for just suggesting that maybe the rise of the zombies and the end of Matthew was allegory and not literally true. So just, suggest <laughs> just suggesting that maybe it wasn't literally true, that it was just some sort of symbolic story, that got him fired. Uh, that was so one of the most amazing stories, by the way, in the Gospels. That, that was absolutely, every time you read over that, you, you're kind of thinking, why is this not talked about? Like, right, yeah. It's way more. <laughs> It reminds me of, there's a line in Genesis 6, where it just says, and the watchers came down and had sex with women, and then there were giants in the world that day. And then it moves <laughs> on. And you're like, whoa, 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 hold on, wait, what? <laughs> like, yeah. uh, there's a whole story there. Well, I want to hear that story. Why do you just throw the line off? And then, of course, later, um, someone wrote essentially a fan fiction based on that one line in Genesis, and it's the book of Enoch, right? Is this, it's the, they took this one line in Genesis that has this creepy weird thing that it says, you don't know what the hell they're talking about yeah. and spun it out into this massive story, which the first Christians were treating as scripture. The book of Enoch was among their scriptures. They could, thought it was a holy word of God. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it reminds me of that. Uh, this idea, there's like this weird throwaway line. Wait a minute, wait, there were all these risen people that walked into the city. Wait, why, why don't we hear more about that story? Why don't we have more documentation of this, more detail? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, 
Um, and I think that's probably what Lacona would say is an argument for it being allegorical, right? Is like, clearly the author did not intend this to be taken literally. Maybe he did, I don't know. But, um, but he certainly is very flippant about uh, the event, uh, considering. You know, the, the fact that somebody can get fired from their job or just kind of observing what we do have good evidence for and then what we can speculate on and then yep. what we might just say, hey, this part has to be taken on faith. We cannot say we know, we must say we believe. And to receive repercussions like that socially, especially from your community of faith, yeah. especially since you have not deconverted or otherwise. That's right. Um, that, but they're protecting something, right? Yes. They're, they're protecting the institution. You can't let that little crack show. That's right. Oh, you yeah, can't yeah. let anybody trip up in it. And that actually happened to me in my community of faith. When I was deconverting, I asked a lot of questions. And uh, that's, in fact, why I made the, the page, Facebook group and all that, fully mm -hmm. deconverted. Yeah. Um, to create a space for people going through that, but their community of faith will not allow discussions on this past the, right. hey, I have some doubts. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Once you start asking too many questions, then it becomes a problem. Yeah, then you're a threat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, and that's uh, also a part of disenfranchising dogma for the greater good, that whole statement taken as a whole is there's no authorities on truth except for truth itself. And it leads us, if it leads us to a space of something <coughs> better, then we're probably likely on the, on the right track. Yeah. But to apply a level of scrutiny to our beliefs, especially when the ones like, and then the, everybody that was dead in the city then raised up or, you know, talking donkeys, snakes, and all this other stuff, or yeah. Jesus is coming back. He's just a little late. <laughs> you know, these are yeah. these are things that it's okay to talk about, and it shouldn't be tab taboo. That's right. Yeah. Discussions shouldn't be stigmatized. Um, was there a part where you were ever really a believer? Um, not so much Christian. Uh, like when I was a kid, I mean, I I believed vaguely that there was a God that you could talk to. Um, but I also believe trees had souls that you could have conversations with trees. So, like, you know, this is, you know, as, as a child, I had a lot of strange beliefs. But um, <laughs> as I grew up, like, like I said, my first real uh, faith belief was Taoism. And in Taoism, God is not a mind or not a person that you can have a conversation with. The Tao is just more like the force in, you know, than Jedi religion or something. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's a kind of like, it, it's, per, it's intentional. Uh, and, and so it's supernatural, but it, it isn't, it isn't a thinking being in a sense. It's, it's just a sort of a way that everybody must align themselves with or else things will go badly for you. And, and it's the thing that governs the universe and creates the universe and all of that. And so, uh, so I, my, my devout religious belief was very alien compared to what most Christians expect or assume of a religion. So I had a very different religious background in that regard. Richard maybe you just don't have an experience with God. And that's why <laughs> you, how, you hold your position, that it, maybe you don't, don't give God the credence that God yeah, he, deserves. He missed his shot uh, when he let the Tao convince me the Tao existed instead. That was his opportunity, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why did the Tao give me a religious experience convincing me it was true, and, and why not God do it? Uh, and, and Taoism was a good religion to me. Like, it, it, uh, it centered me, it made me a much happier person, it made me a, a, you know, a more morally centered person. Uh, a more conscientious person. Um, and uh, it, it did all of the things that people talk about, like when they convert to Christianity as, oh, it made me, it so much improved my life. It's like, yeah, Taoism did all the same stuff to me. Uh, and, and that's when I realized, you know, once I finally realized it was false, um, I was like, oh, well, actually you can convince yourself of any kind of like deep wisdom or any kind of, uh, of system like this that you, and you can convince yourself that you're in touch with something supernatural and powerful. Uh, and, and, and it's false. And so if, if, if Taoism can do that to me, Christianity could be doing it to uh, Christians, Islam, Buddhism. It, it's it's all the same phenomenon, basically. And, and the fact that it results in different outcomes in terms of what people think they're being told by this divine power it is pretty much proof enough that, that there is no divine power. If there was, all the messages would be consistent. There would be only divine power and would only be sending the one correct gospel, whatever it was. And that would be recorded all throughout the last you know, 10,000 years of history and, and so on.